ISA 240, the auditor's responsibility relating to fraud. So guys, I mentioned this earlier. I want to make sure we are all on the same page here. This is an auditing standard. that is relevant to the audit process. So i.e. when we start an audit, we've got to go through the entire process of accepting an a client and then planning our audit and performing and concluding. That's the audit process. This standard is relevant to us throughout the audit process. We have not started the audit process. We are doing legislation. And this standard has become applicable to us because we are doing conduct of auditors in terms of the CPC and conduct in terms of the APA. And there is a responsibility in the APA if we identify fraud in a client to report this because there's a reportable irregularity. So this standard works here purely because it deals with our responsibilities with regards to fraud and fraud has just been addressed. However, this is our responsibilities throughout the entire audit process, which we have not quite got to. Okay, so it's going to be very difficult for me to go into the detail of this is our responsibility at the planning stage. This is our responsibility at the concluding stage when we don't even know what else is addressed in those stages just yet. So I am going to address it but I'm going to do it very high level and I'm going to keep referring you to other standards so that you can make the note on your slide to refer to ISA 315, to refer to ISA 330, so that when we do address those and when you get to revision, you are able to make the connection now. Oh, okay, so this is the planning. This was for our responsibility with regards to fraud in the planning. I understand the whole planning stage now and I've got a little bit of extra work to add into it because I have to do work for fraud. Same with concluding, same with performing. Okay, so a nice starting point is to understand what fraud is. And in order to do that, if we do the comparison between error, it makes it a lot more obvious. So fraud is intentional. Somebody planned this. They planned to misrepresent information in the financials. They planned the theft of assets or information. As opposed to error, which is unintentional, it was a mistake. Had the person seen the misrepresentation, the theft, they would have said, oh no, I should not have accessed this information. I should not be changing this information. It was unintentional. It's a lot easier to pick up unintentional errors because somebody didn't try to hide. It could even be considered obvious when you see it versus intentional. There was intent to hide so that somebody can't pick it up. So there's an entire standard dedicated to what our responsibilities are to fraud in a set of financials because there's intention behind it. So we have a responsibility as auditors 
to consider that that could happen. But who would you say is responsible for identifying fraud in the financials? Who is responsible for trying to prevent fraud in the financials? Management. Of the client is responsible for having steps, for having controls, for considering the possibilities of fraud and to prevent it. And if it hasn't been prevented, to detect it and to correct it once it has been identified. Management of the clients are responsible. We are required to be aware of it and we are required to follow these steps in considerations of fraud. In the planning stage of the audit guys, we need to act with professional skepticism. That means we need to question things. We don't just accept what the client says. We need proof. Because proof will mean that we've done a little bit of digging, consideration to support anything they provide us. We, as an audit team, would have to discuss the possibilities of fraud where we think they could be susceptible to fraud so that as an audit team, we can be aware. We are then going to have to perform procedures that will help us to identify. However, if we don't identify having done these, it is not our fault. So we're going to have procedures. We are then going to have to specifically identify and assess the risks of fraud. Once again, following a set of rules and requirements, we need to consider fraud specifically and think about what the risks of fraud are. And then once we have identified risks of fraud, we need to respond to those risks of fraud. They are only risks at this point. Yeah. That's our responsibility in terms of this standard. Once we have done everything that would then form part of the planning stage, we need to evaluate our audit evidence to see if there were actually instances of fraud after having considered there could have been risks of fraud. And based on that, if there is fraud, consider if we can continue with the clients, consider communicating with those charged with management and regulatory enforcements such as ERBA. So at this point, I just want you to be aware that we have specific responsibilities in performing the audit to consider fraud, to think about the risks of fraud within the specific clients and how we could respond to those risks and then actually perform procedures that are going to address those. And at the end, if we do pick up fraud, we need to communicate it with URBA per the Auditing Profession Act. Okay, the details of this, guys, we will address when we do the audit process, working through the planning stage and the performing and the concluding. But if you are aware that we have got specific duties and we've got to give fraud specific consideration, now at this point, it links nicely with the APA. So I am going to just highlight some of the very important parts and requirements such as the identification of risks and how we would respond. But I know that we are going to address this again 
in the planning stage. So identifying the risks of fraud at a financial statement level and at an assertion level. So risk at the financial statement level means that this fraud risk pervasively affects the financials as a whole and therefore affects many assertions. So there's one fraud risk indicator but it affects multiple balances and transactions. So like we just said, bonus based on profits, profits affects all your income items, all your expense items. So anything there could be misstated to increase profits to get that bonus. Versus bonus based on revenue, they're not going to misstate expenses because the bonus is based on revenue. The only thing they're going to misstate for that bonus is revenue, so that would be a risk at the assertion level. Okay, ISA 240, Appendix 1 and Appendix 3 give us a list of risks that could affect the financials as a whole and even some that are specific to balances and transactions. But they just give you a, a complete list. And how they go about determining that list is they split risks in two. There's an incentive or pressure to manipulate the financial statements or to steal. Or there's an opportunity in the business to manipulate the financial statements or to steal. Or their attitude, somebody's attitude allows them to rationalize manipulating the financials or stealing. So somebody says, oh, this company has so many pens. I really need some pens at home and take some pens. Okay, so they rationalize, they justify manipulating the financials or stealing. And so these ultimately are fraud risk factors that result in fraudulent financial reporting which is manipulating the financials or misappropriation of assets which is stealing. Okay, and what did we say a reportable irregularity point two was? Amounts to fraudulent behavior or theft. And so fraudulent financial reporting or misappropriation of assets are fraud. So they give us a whole comprehensive list of different types of incentives or pressures that the business or people could feel that could help them to manipulate financials or to steal, list of opportunities that could um, assist them in stealing or manipulating financials, and attitudes that people could have that um, justify actually doing this. So let's quickly go have a look at Appendix 1 and 2, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so Appendix 1, examples of fraud risk factors. Here's some incentives or pressures that you might find in a scenario. There's a high degree of competition. Or they're changing their technology or their products. They're losing customers. They're facing operating losses. So any of your going concern indicators will bring about incentives or pressures. 
rapid growth within a business might not allow their controls to actually be able to help them. Pressures that could exist with management if they need to get additional debt or they've got expectations that the shareholders or investors create on them that they can't actually adhere to. Some opportunities for fraudulent financial reporting. Related party transactions. So whenever there's related parties, there's opportunities for fraud. Or if they have lots of estimates, opportunities for fraud. Or highly unusual complex transactions. Okay? Operations across international borders where they've got different cultures or tax haven areas. If Management is dominated by a single person or group of persons. So a family is the board. Then there's too much control of one family, which could create opportunities. High turnover of staff could create opportunities. And then rationalizations, if they don't have codes of conduct or ethical standards, then anybody can justify it misstating financials. Okay, if they have weak internal controls, low morale in management, they think they're going to lose their jobs, they're always threatened with their jobs. Okay, if there's a strained relationship between the auditors and management, could be a big concern that could result in fraudulent financial reporting. Fraud risk factors that could be or give rise to misappropriation of assets, so incentives or pressures, if people think they're going to lose their jobs, that's a pressure for them to steal. Opportunities if there's large amounts of cash or small items with high value, that's their stock. Okay, so it's like cell phones or jewelry, some things that they can quickly take and nobody will really see and then they can get a large amount for them. Lack of segregation of duty, so whether controls are not working, Okay, lack of rotation of staff. So one person is there monitoring petty cash for years that nobody can pick up that petty cash is being stolen. And then attitudes or rationalization if they tolerate in the business theft of petty cash or your, your employees are once again unhappy or dissatisfied then they can justify why they're stealing things. Okay, I wanted to show you what's in Appendix 3. Okay, some other examples. Last minute adjustments to the financials could be an indicator that there's fraud. Missing documents, they can't give us the documents we've asked or if they look like the documents have been altered. If there's any discrepancies between confirmations received from external parties, large number of credit journals in accounts receivables or vice versa in accounts payables, missing inventory or assets when you try to do physical verification, or less responses from third parties when you send out those confirmations. Okay, They won't allow us access to records, so there's a limitation imposed. Why? Delays in getting information, tolerance or violations of the code of conduct, all of those could be additional indicators that there could be fraud within this entity. Now we get to how to identify risks at the assertion level. So some of those you can see will be applicable to specific balances and transactions but there are some additional.